Hey, today I want you to join me in solving a mystery. Because, you know, depression like anxiety or other mental uh, health challenges are often mysteries. Depression really is a mystery. Like any good mystery, there are a lot of questions around it. And today I want you to join me. We're going to dive into God's Word. You can go ahead and turn to the book of Psalm. In fact, Psalms, grab your Bible and turn there to Psalm 42 is where we're going to be. Uh, in a mystery, you, know, you have various characters, right? You've got the protagonist, the antagonist, probably. You have a puzzle that you're trying to figure out. People come in, different characters. There's twists and turns along the way, and we're going to see that today. That's the way that depression goes, in fact. But the case, often in a mystery, is solved in the most unusual place. In fact, sometimes it's right in front of us, and we don't even see it. And you're going to find that to be the case today. So I want to explore this mystery that is depression. It's a kind of mystery. In fact, we don't really know how you get it, right? It's not a virus, uh, though, though often uh, there are chemical imbalances that are in the body and such, but the exact physical causes of depression uh, remain unknown. Uh, I mean, there's no real test for it, hardly. Uh, we, we have so many questions about it. Many would say that some tra sometimes childhood trauma, maybe through genetics, uh, can play a role into the biological origins of depression. Certain stress and anxiety can bring upon, often anxiety uh, leads to depression. But with all of our sophistication in psychology and in medicine, uh, we're still not real clear about how you get it or how to fix it. And though with clinical depression, you know, there is medical help, but there's no, there's no magic pill. There's not really a medical diagnosis for depression, like a blood test you know, or a brain scan or something like that. So diagnoses are still, even in this day, very much a subjective kind of matter and criteria. Now, now some research shows that even up to 50% of all patients who struggle or who take medication for for depression actually don't respond to the medication uh, over the long term. And so there's still so many questions out there. Depression remains a mystery, not unlike Winston Churchill's uh, words when he was describing Russia in 1939. He says it's a riddle map wrapped up in a mystery inside an enigma. Today, I want us to find the solution to this mystery. And I think this message will be an encouragement to all of us because we all wrestle with these kinds of issues and particularly in these days. So I'm going to just say it again. It's okay to not be okay. We've been saying throughout this season for us to wrestle and to struggle. And when we hear testimonies like Phil's and others who just share honestly about what we're going through, we all can relate in some way. And I'm so glad you're listening today. And if you're facing depression today, I just want to say it out loud as your pastor. I want to say this. It doesn't mean that you're not a good Christian, right? Whatever that means. I think that means we humble ourselves before God, receive His grace. It doesn't mean that you're not trying hard enough. It doesn't mean that you're somehow God's punishing you can often feel that way. It doesn't mean that you're not pursuing Him or desiring to worship Him with all your life. What it means is that you're human. That's what it means. Because we live in a fallen world. Perhaps you know someone or you struggle with depression. I'd like to encourage you. Share this message with friends and family members. One of my best friends in all of my life I grew up with uh, got jumped by depression a few years ago. Uh, Dan is uh, known for his, his strength, uh, frankly. I mean, spiritually, physically. He was an all-star football player, ended up playing college football. He was, has been a successful lawyer. Now he's a, he's a judge. And, and, and he walked through a season about three years ago when uh, he just debilitating depression came over him. Really out of nowhere, it seemed. And I know others. As a pastor, I hear stories like this all the time. And if it weren't for a group of godly friends, I still have this group of, of uh, Christian brothers from high school. Uh, all these years, we came around Dan and just encouraged him. And yes, through a doctor, a trusted doctor getting help, he was able to get the kind of help he needed and some medication along the way as well. And Dan is doing much better today. And he's a different man. He would say for all, all good and good ways and to the glory of God. But it, it just seems to come out of nowhere sometimes. And, and the word depression can even be 
uh, kind of misleading. The word literally means pressed down. So we all know what it is to feel the weight of life and to be pressed down. It didn't become a psychological term until around the early 1900s, but everyone's felt pressed down. Everyone's felt the weight of life coming on us. This occurs when we face situations, you know, a setback at work. Uh, sometimes there's that postpartum depression that some of our women have experienced. Some moms, see, we, a loss of any kind can lead to depression. I remember a season of great loss in my own life. I remember when my, my dad passed away, certain losses in my life personally, and I walked through a season that was dark. I don't know if it was depression, and even that's kind of a mystery, isn't it? Is that clinical depression? Am I rest- So we, we share with others. We seek help. Uh, but, but sadness often uh, can be a temporary thing that we finally come out of, but major, uh, major uh, de- you know, depressive disorder. Uh, MDD is something that some of us live with chronically and some of us can wrestle with depression for years again what a mystery depression is the most common mental health disorder after anxiety as we talked about anxiety last week often leads to depression MDD affects about seven to ten percent of all adults currently even now uh, listening to this message and about 21 percent 25 percent of us about one out of four will experience mdd sometime in our lifetime but again all of us struggle uh, with depressive times and being pressed down and overwhelmed in life it's interesting too a mystery women uh, suffer with depression about twice as much as men but men end up being a bit more responsive emotionally in depressive states, anger, and, and sometimes expressed in, in violence or even suicide. So it's, it's a mystery, and, and though there are gender differences, we all can relate to this message today. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of depression, as I've noted. Uh, there, there's, there's postpartum depression, there's persistent depressive disorder. It's called dysemia. It, it's um, a mild, constant depression. Dysemia is what it is. Seasonal uh, affective disorder is another one. I think I struggle with this one. SAD is the acronym, and it's often during the winter months. Um, can be, you know, the shorter days, the darker days, and can be so challenging. Let's just all, I think there's a new one out there now that we all wrestle. Let's just call it 2020 right? A new long-term depression that's hitting all of us. So this message is for all of us, is why I'm saying all this. We Googled it, right, in our, in our, in our questions. we trying to answer this mystery. Lots of medication out there, psychological, physiological helps that we can get. And, and, and then Christians, we have our own list, right? Pray more, go to church more, be happy, remember how much God loves you, talk to other people, serve others, get outside yourself. All those are good things. In fact, great things. But we'll see today, you can't just hit a switch, right? You can't just flip a switch and suddenly uh, there's this quick fix, right? So turn to Psalm 42, again, if you're not yet there. And I want to set this up. It's real interesting, this Psalm. Psalm 42 and 43 go together. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at Psalm 43 in your Bible, there's no heading. There's no instruction, uh, which is really unusual. There's no title. Both the Psalms share the same chorus, which is interesting. So you would think, well, they go together in some way. And keep in mind, this is written by a worship leader, okay? So a godly, uh, you know, pastor, worship leader. Now, uh, keep this in mind because you can actually be a worship leader, okay? You can be a pastor. Uh, Your song can be sung for millennia to encourage people. It can be found in the Word of God, and you can still struggle with despair and depression. So all of us can wrestle with depression and watch this he wants us to sing this song now uh, to sing songs of despair like this we don't often do that do we Uh, which makes me think that often we think worship just has to be you know hype it's got to be upbeat it's got to be happy I've got to be happy to worship God I want to uh, do away with that myth today we can worship God in the darkness so look at this first of all I want you to see depression can cause us to question God We're going to see three things today. It it can cause us to question God. It can cause us to question ourselves, but but it can also cause us to question our worship. And I'm going to challenge you to to know this. All of those can be great challenges. And we can run to God and grow in this, or we can turn away from Him. So first, depression can cause us to question God. First, it, it should cause us to cry out to God, and that's what we see the psalmist do. As the deer, he says, look at verse 1, as the deer pants for flowing streams, or as the deer pants for the water, so my soul uh, 
my soul for you, O God, pants for you, O God. Now, many of you know the song, As the Deer, right? It was written like uh, 30 some odd years ago. Uh, We often would sing it so sweetly, you know, and so gently, softly. This is a cry to God. He's crying out to God. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to solve this mystery, he says. And in verse 2, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where shall I come and appear before God? Now, this phrase, appear before God, is really a reference to corporate worship. How interesting is that? He is missing being with the family of God, being with God's people, worshiping the Lord. The singer now represents himself as one who's separated from the body, if you will, in our language today, among God's people. And he longs to be back and worshiping together with others. He he finds himself subject to the taunts of other people who who, um, just kind of despise his, his faith. But like any good mystery... There are many questions, and questions are good. When is this going to end? Where? How long? But listen, questions can help us get to the solution. You can't solve any mystery if you don't ask questions, and a lot of them. But you got to ask the right questions, right? And you got to know where to go with your questions. Look at verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? See, other questions or others' questions are are now his questions. He's starting to say, hey, you know what? I I am kind of in a mess, and I do claim to be a Christian. What is the deal, and where is God? Look at verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. He's, he's a worship leader. He's remembering leading people to God. He, he was a, an influencer. He's pointing people to praise God. He's remembering these things, shouts of joy, worship with God's people. See, when you're, when you're down, you remember. And that can be a good thing. Count your blessings that you have. But notice he's saying, man, I used to do this. I used to go to church, right? We used to be together in church. We used to sing together. We used to be happy in the Lord together. There's such an encouragement there, and he longs for it again. Watch this. Depression can cause you to question God, but that can be a very good thing. But depression can also cause you to question uh, question ourselves, can cause you to question yourself now look at this this portion sharpens the description uh, of the singer's situation look at verse five why are you cast down oh my soul and why are you in turmoil within me hope in god see how he's, he's speaking to himself hope in god for i shall again praise him my salvation and my god my soul is downcast within me therefore i remember you from the land of jordan and of harem and mount mazar now the singer, the leader, locates himself far from Jerusalem. This is significant, which, which is where the sanctuary is, right? So he's far away from the location of the presence of God. Okay, that's the temple. Now, now, now we know that then Jesus comes. How about this? He becomes, he tabernacles among us, it says in John chapter 1. And he, he takes on flesh. The location of the presence of God was in Christ himself. Well, then Christ, after his death on the cross, resurrection and ascension, the Spirit comes. Now we have the Spirit residing in us. In fact, the Bible says we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's a couple of things here. One, the psalmist, he, we got a couple of things working for us. One, Jesus teaches us that we don't have to go to the sanctuary to worship God, right? We don't have to go to the temple to worship God. But, but I wonder if you see... What the psalmist saw here, this regular gathering of God's people together is a pure gift of grace. And if you're like me, you you, you miss it in these days, I think in ways we don't fully understand. I think when we come back together, we're going to feel a sense of the power of God in our lives again because we're designed to worship Him together. The regular habit of corporate worship reminds us of the truth of who God is and who we are and how prone we are to forget. We're encouraged by the love of others. Other worshipers proclaim what we maybe can't proclaim on that particular day. See, the psalmist knew the importance of the gathering. But here's the problem. Many of us had already fallen into a habit 
of not worshiping the Lord regularly on the Lord's day or some other day. So we lose the power and the presence of God in our lives and the reminder of who He is. But secondly, this, this teaches us that we have now the presence of God with us wherever we go. Jesus is the one who taught us. You don't have to worship Him on that mountain or in this place or that place. He's always with you. And I would say, yes, even, how about even more, in your despair, in your darkness and depression. He is with you. He never leaves you. It's okay to question God. And I would say here, it's okay to question yourself. In fact, it can be a very helpful thing. Look at verse 7. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. He's saying, man, there's thundering waves just crashing over me. This sense of chaos and disruption. It's depression that's crashing over me. Then look uh, at verse 9. His circumstances lead him to believe that God's left him. In verse 9, he says, I say to God, my rock. Watch this. He's like schizophrenic. He's my rock. But why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? See, he thinks God has forgotten him. And he, he's, he's the one who has forgotten God himself. He, 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 he thinks God's left him. But you know, you see him and he's my rock and he's my salvation. And then where are you? Look at the roller coaster he's on. Depression is like that. We find ourselves on this, on this roller coaster when we look at our circumstances and not speak the truth into our lives. Look at verse 10. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? There it is again. He feels like there's this mortal, like he's taking on a mortal wound. Um, like he's going to die. I mean, I mean, severe depression feels like that. I've talked to people who say, I mean, this is like a, like a weight on my chest, literally. And, and, and though it may be illogical, I feel like I'm going to die from this. I'm not going to make it out of this. And the question that he asks is the question, why? Why am I so down, really? Friends, listen, when you're in a depressive state, when you're in despair, even anxiety uh, it, it ridden at times in your life, the question to ask, among all the questions to seek to solve the mystery, is why? Why am I really like this? It's one to, to wrestle with before God within yourself, but yes, with others. Look at verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise in my salvation and my God. Now, as he's interrogating his own heart, he sings. And one of the major problems with depression is this. We lie to ourselves. What the psalmist is teaching us here is speak truth to yourself. We've been talking about this in these days. So, so, so the question is why? I mean, is this real, what I'm walking through? Oftentimes in anxiety and depression, we have these illogical thoughts and it helps to unpack them with others. Last week, Travis referenced uh, Richard Baxter in his sermon on anxiety, a Puritan pastor out of the 1600s. Well, he wrote a lot about anxiety and depression, noting that this is not a new thing. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a pastor uh, at Westminster Chapel in London in the 1900s, he wrote a classic book called Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures. It, it, he says in it, he says it's vital for us to learn to talk to ourselves rather than letting our circumstances of life speak to us. He writes this, listen to this. The wisdom of those who are spiritually depressed is to have the spiritual mind to speak to the emotions and not allow the emotions to speak to the mind. I'd say it this way, faith drives us to facts. See, as we turn to God and the truth about who He is, and yes, in His Word, you've got to be in His Word. And you discover the truth about who He is and about who we are. Faith drives us to facts, but I could flip that as well. Facts drive us to faith. See, if, if there is a compounding effect of depression, there's also a, a, an opposite uh, compounding effect of faith on the facts of who God is that builds up in us and brings strength to us. So the psalmist proclaims truth about God, but then he's right back uh, to, to where he was. My soul is cast down in me. He's my rock. You're my salvation. God, why have you left me? Isn't that the state we find ourselves in often? It's because we've got to continue to remind ourselves of his love for us and who he is. 
It, it also teaches us that we can't cure depression with a catchy you know, chorus or a few phrases or some simple formula. I'm so grateful the Bible is so honest, so real. He, he says depression is like a wave that keeps coming over him. Like, I'm drowning here, God, are you serious? And then he's back to God is my rock. and he's my. So we've got to continue. Even this song ends in darkness. This is not one of those psalms of reorientation. It actually ends with him still in this funk. This teaches us that if you write a song, you know, a couple of millennia ago, uh, and it's still being sung today, you, you can still struggle with depression. And some of us think, man, if Jesus would just show up, or, you know, if he'd just speak the right words, I'd pop up and I'd be okay. Or if the pastor would say the right things, or if a friend or a spouse or, or somebody would say the right things, people around me would help me, then I'd be okay. But, you know, pray more, go to church more, talk about it more. There's no quick answer, is there? Well, all those things are important. But let's press on. We haven't yet solved the mystery. Depression can cause us to question God. That can be very productive. Uh, it can also cause us to question ourselves. That, too, can be very productive. Why am I struggling here? But finally, I want you to see this. Depression can cause us to question our worship. The trials and struggles, loss and pain and grief can cause us to turn away from God or they can cause us to turn to God. You see, this is an opportunity that we have, even in the midst of depression, to solidify our worship before God. We've talked about this recently. Do I worship God because of all that he's done for me or what he might do for me? As if there's this law of reciprocity. Worship is, I will, I'll do this and then God will do that. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping whatever it is you want from him, right? Look, the mystery is solved when we look right in the middle of this psalm. I want you to see something. You may have noticed I jumped right past verse 8. It is here that the psalmist gives us something. He gives us a chiasm. He gives us a chiasm. This is a literary device. It's used in, in po poetic literature, but it's also used in songs and writing where the writer places the answer right in the middle of the psalm. He plants the answer to the mystery, the solution to the mystery, right in the center. It's not a hook, you know, after, after a chorus or a refrain, like at the climax of a song we might hear today. The hook, the answer is in the middle. There's a message in the middle. There's a miracle in the middle. Often in mysteries, the answer's right in front of us. The, the, the answer, the solution is right there. Look at verse 8. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He says, by day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me. Watch this, day and night. That's another way of saying all the time. All the time. And yes, in the middle of the night, he commands, it says. He commands his steadfast love. His song over me becomes my prayer. Watch this. He ends up in my depression right there with me, interceding on my behalf, even when I don't know how to pray, even when I don't want to pray. He's there with me. In times of depression, anxiety, grief, and pain, we are focused to question our worship. Who or what do we worship? Really? I could argue that's the most important question of life. And what comes into our minds, as A.W. Tozer said, when we think about God, is the most important thing about us. The most important question is, who or what do you worship? You see, we need to get rid of the notion, friends, listen, that worship means that I'm happy. Go lucky, bubbly over, you know, all things in the world, without a care in the world. We need to get beyond that. Listen, you and I can worship God in the dark night of the soul. We can worship him on the mountaintop, yes, but we can worship him in the valley. We can worship him, as the psalmist says, in the daytime. We can worship him at night. Martin Lloyd-Jones Lloyd noted that often it's the sins of our past or maybe habitual sin that leave us in despair. I know there have been times in my life where sin or my past sins have just pressed me down like I can't be forgiven. That can often lead me away from God's grace. He says this, we must never look at any sin in our past life in any way except that which leads us to praise God and to magnify His grace in Christ Jesus. He goes on to write, How easy is it to read the Scriptures and to give a kind of nominal assent 
to the truth and yet never appropriate what it actually tells us. Wow. So as I close, here's what I want to do. Let's, let's apply this message, all right? A spiritual war is going on inside of you. And I'm not saying, again, that if you struggle with depression or anxiety, that, you, that you're somehow not spiritual enough. But we all need to recognize the fact that there's a civil war in us between a dead man, okay, a zombie who's seeking to remain alive in us, and those of us who are alive in Christ. It's like there's two men going on, if you will, two women in your life, two, two, two boys or girls. Romans 7, Paul puts it this way. He says, for I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. He finds himself doing, and all of this, watch this, starts in the mind. He's finding himself doing things he does not want to do. There's really two forces going on. There's the dead man, and there's the one that's alive. Here's what Jones writes. Listen to this. This other man within us has got to be handled. Do not listen to him. Turn on him. Speak to him. Condemn him. Upbraid him. Exhort him. Encourage him. Remind him of what you know. Instead of listening placidly to him and allowing him to drag you down and depress you. I love that. We need to get militant, friends, about this voice that is in our heads. And there is an evil one speaking lies to us constantly. Paul says it this way, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with the flesh I serve the law of sin. He says, I've got to remain in the Spirit. He said, keep in step with the Spirit. Well, how do you do that? You remain in the truth. You abide in Him, is how we say it. You walk with Him every single day. Every morning, friends, listen, I've got to get up and say, Lord, remind me again how much you love me. I do this constantly. It's a, it's a prayer that I pray all the time. Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. Because his love is what motivates me to obedience. You see, you must preach the gospel to yourself every day. Preaching the gospel to yourself is better than listening to yourself. You need to run to the Father. It's kind of like the kid who, who, who broke some other kid's toy, you know? And you run back to the father and say, hey, he broke my toy. He, 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 I'm not happy about it. You need to deal with that, Dad. It's running to the father and saying, hey, listen, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And you run to the father and say, Lord, remind me again of the truth about me. Tell yourself what's up. That's what I want you to hear today. Don't put up with it. Get militant. Stop the lies in your life that are coming at you. Stop the noise. End the lies of the evil one. Tell yourself what's up. So how do you solve a mystery? Well, you ask the right questions. Here's what we see in the Psalms. Why is the key question right here. And then listen to the right people. Not someone who will bring a false witness, right? You don't do that. You listen to the truth. You listen primarily to Jesus. What does He say about you? You abide in Him. You cling to Him. And then you discover the facts. See, solving a mystery is all about finding facts, uncovering the facts about the case. Get to the truth. How do you solve a mystery? Well, in the end, you speak the truth. Once you have uh, discovered the facts, you know, you've asked the right questions, you listen to the right people, you speak the truth. Share your feelings, first with yourself, then with your friends, with others. And I would even say this, you have an opportunity, friends, we have an opportunity, even as Phil has done today and others have done in recent days, to share our story and to encourage others to be light and salt for others. So many are struggling in this time. So the key personal question is why? Why am I so downcast? But friends, listen, never forget the one who asked the same question. The question comes out of the Psalms, not this Psalm, but Psalm 22, which really is the soundtrack of the crucifixion, where Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Listen, the Psalm that Jesus memorized and cried out from the cross was that Psalm. Why? Why have you forsaken me? And what we see there is this collision of the justice of God and His grace there on the cross and redemption was made possible for you and for me. God used the most tragic moment in history to do the greatest work that He's ever done. 
And friend, if you're struggling today, and we're all struggling varying degrees, He's doing His best work in you right now. If it happened on the cross, listen, you need to know this, He has not left you, and He never will. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He bore on Himself, Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds we have been healed. Friends, the solution to depression, the solution to the mystery is Jesus Himself. It's the very presence of God over you, speaking truth over you, singing over your life His grace and His love. So I want to ask you as we close, have you received His grace? Are you walking through this dark valley alone? I I want us to just pray together as we close our time. If you would just do that right where you are, just bow your head and close your eyes. Friend, if you've never received the grace of Christ, and this is your day, you are struggling, you're challenged in these days, or maybe you, you have never said yes to Him, I want you to say yes. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for taking on uh, this this darkness, this shame, and the questions of of abandonment. And and you took it upon yourself so that I might make it through my darkest moments as well. Friend, just receive His grace now. Say, thank you for dying on the cross, taking on my sin. I receive your love and your grace, your forgiveness. I give you my life. And now make me all that you've created me to be. Lord, we love you, and we thank you that you are with us, even through the darkest nights of the soul. We praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.